Hi, Chris Potts here. Uh, this screencast is an introduction to pragmatics, and in particular, an introduction to the vision for pragmatics that Grice develops in his famous article, Logic and Conversation. Our goals are to get a better understanding of pragmatic phenomena in particular, and to better understand the Gricean cooperative principle and its associated maxims, since these are the core of the theory that Grice developed. This screencast covers the background and some context, and the next one is a review of Grice's framework driven by lots of examples. Let's start with a bit of a refresher. In section one here, I have a pretty good working definition of pragmatics. It says, pragmatics is the study of the ways we enrich the conventionalized meanings of the things we say and hear into their fuller intended meanings. And you can hear in that an interplay between semantics, the conventional part, and pragmatics. And I think this definition isn't presupposing that the conventions are rock solid or understood in the same way by everyone. We can have our vagueness and lexical uncertainty and everything, and we can expect that those things will shape the pragmatic enrichment process. I've also added here that in class, we'll focus on the principles that govern this enrichment process with special emphasis on the extent to which they are systematic and universal. And there are two main parts to that, systematic and universal. The systematic part is what Grice seeks to account for. The universal part is a bit more nuanced, so I just want to plant a seed for that. We want to consider the extent to which pragmatics is the same and different the world over, and what might be shaping that overall picture of both stability and variation. In section 1.1, I've repeated Levinson's analogy, which I used in our initial course overview to introduce pragmatics itself. In a nutshell, Levinson begins by noting that we can all interpret this picture in some basic sense. We see a person in the center with people gathered around and some buildings and other structures in the background. And then Levinson asks us to look closely, right? Look again, this is just a bunch of scribbles. Nothing is depicted in any realistic sense here. And yet, via some amazing cognitive process, we're able to arrive at a common understanding of what's depicted. And I'd add that while we all probably share this common understanding, there might also be differences in what we see, and those differences might relate to our cultural backgrounds. For example, if you know a bit about Western iconography, you might infer that this is a Christ figure in the center with disciples surrounding. And if you notice that it's a Rembrandt sketch and you're an art history major, then you might be able to glean a whole lot more from the, from the picture about when Rembrandt did this and what his goals were and how people received this picture at various points in history and on and on like that. Enrichment is systematic, but it can also be very particular to us as individuals and groups. And of course, Levinson's analogy is that understanding language is the same way, including both the common core and also all this very particular enrichment. Levinson says, an utterance is not, as it were, of a ridical model or snapshot of the scene it describes. Rather, an utterance is just as sketchy as the Rembrandt drawing. The utterances we exchange with each other are just sketches. They barely even outline what we want to communicate. And yet we're able to communicate our intentions. Again, some amazing cognitive, cultural, and linguistic processes are making this possible. And the goal of pragmatics is really to characterize these processes. This can be a window into cognition and culture, and it can certainly help with technology development, as I've noted in footnote one here. Section 1.2, an approach to variation. Let's frame out this important topic so that we can have it in mind as we work through the material. To start, I wanna identify a tension that you'll see develop. One of the fundamental claims of pragmatic theory is that most, perhaps all, pragmatic enrichment is the product of basic principles of rationality. And we'll discuss what this means extensively. Grice is sort of characterizing a very particular notion of rationality. Okay, but this seems to suggest the absurdly incorrect conclusion that pragmatic enrichment is the same the world over. And I want to emphasize that that's truly absurdly incorrect. There is a lot of variation in terms of pragmatic enrichment. So here's how we'll seek to resolve this tension. We propose to resolve it as follows. The basic pragmatic principles are the same the world over. But just as our differing backgrounds lead us to extract different information from the Rembrandt sketch, so too can they lead us to different pragmatic enrichments. Let's turn now to section 1.3, a bit of history. Our associated reading is, of course, Grice's Logic and Conversation. And I'll say the paper is not an especially easy one to read. 
And some of the difficulties are the result, perhaps pretty predictably, of the fact that the context in which the paper was produced is really important. So these historical notes might help you situate you a bit as a reader. First, a connection with Chomsky. In the early 1960s, Chomsky showed us how to give compact general specifications of natural language syntax. You might have seen these things, sets of rules that explain which tree structures are grammatical in a given language. The idea is that those rules capture people's knowledge of language in some abstract sense and help us understand people's linguistic judgments and behaviors. Now, I should emphasize that Chomsky focused really only on form-based things in language, syntax, and also some morphology, which is really the syntax of words, and phonology, which is, on Chomsky's construal, the syntax of sounds, in effect. And Chomsky was actively and very vocally opposed to studying semantics in the sense that we've been studying it, and the idea of studying pragmatics was completely beyond the pale. His view is that all of that was hopelessly unscientific and uninteresting from the point of view of language. And Chomsky can be really incredibly strident and dismissive, and he still sounds this way about these topics, uh, by the way, but he's, he's a touch more subdued these, day, these days since semantics and pragmatics are now very successful parts of linguistics, clearly. But back in the 1960s, he was really adamant that studying meaning was not studying linguistics. So it's really to Grice's credit that he seems to have seen through all that. Philosopher and linguist H. Paul Grice had the inspired idea to do this Chomskyan thing for pragmatics. Chomsky was giving compact descriptions in terms of rule sets, and Grice wanted to do something similar for communication. Now, of course, any theory of pragmatics is not going to be composed of strict rules. Communication is much too fluid and freeform and creative for that. So the compact descriptions that Grice aimed to give have a very different character from Chomsky's grammars, as you'll see. But the scientific insight about explanation is, I think, shared. My second historical note is related directly to the overall framing of the paper and the introduction to the paper itself. Now, Grice spent most of his career at UC Berkeley, but he was English by origin and trained as a philosopher in England at a time of great change in the philosophy of language. I won't read this first long quotation for you. The essence of it is that the old guard philosophers when Grice was a student, Gottlob Frege, Bertrand Russell, Ludwig Wittgenstein, did study and write about language, but not with the goal of understanding natural language itself. Rather, they hope to use natural languages as inspiration in some sense for developing logically perfect languages that could be used as the language of science. For example, I believe they hope to automate discovery in mathematics and even in fields like physics and biology. The ordinary language philosophers came in somewhat later and were in part reacting to this approach. These philosophers include J.L. Austin and, in a twist, Wittgenstein, who famously rejected a lot of his earlier work and advised, don't ask for the meaning, ask for the use, which is a radically pragmatic thing to say. These ordinary language philosophers wanted to take language seriously, and in doing that, they rejected the idea that logic and math and so forth could be of any use for studying language. They sort of embraced the messiness they saw and decided that that was the essential thing. Communication is messy. In this context, Grice is again a visionary and a mediator. He seeks to strike a balance between these two extremes. That is, he sees a role for logic and sees it as useful in understanding the apparent messiness of language. So he's a mediator helping to synthesize old and warring factions in philosophy and develop a new perspective on that basis. And that's really the backdrop for logic and conversation. Here I've reproduced the opening of the paper, and I hope that the above historical notes make it clearer what this passage is meant to do. The passage begins, It is a commonplace of philosophical logic that there are, or appear to be, divergences in meaning between, on the one hand, at least some of what I shall call the formal devices, and he lists out some symbols, and, and by the way, this sentence is very typical of the Gricean style. The number of parentheticals is really remarkable. It takes some getting used to, and it's very hard to read aloud, but it's all reflective of how carefully he's seeking to circumscribe his claims. Okay, so in essence, he's saying, it's a commonplace of philosophical logic that there are divergences between the logical symbols and what are taken to be their analogs or counterparts in natural language. And you can see the alignment here. In the common notation of Grice's time, this wavy line was a negation. 
this wedge was conjunction, this V was disjunction, the horseshoe was if-then, and this backward E was an existential quantifier, and this integral sign was a definite article of some kind. So that's the setup. And that's what the ordinary language philosophers took as their starting point. The natural language expressions don't behave like the logical ones, and so associating them in this way is misleading and wrong. But Grice disputes that. He writes, I wish, rather, to maintain that the common assumption of the contestants, that the divergences do in fact exist, is, broadly speaking, a common mistake, and that the mistake arises from an inadequate attention to the nature and importance of the conditions governing conversation. That's really the big idea. The associations that we just saw are real and useful, but they're about the semantics, and the apparent divergences arise systematically from the semantics and the nature of communication. So really, he's saying what I said when I define pragmatics. This is the study of the way we enrich the conventionalized meanings of the things we say in here into their fuller intended meanings. We take this framing for granted now, but it was really Grice who first articulated it in a compelling and clear way. By way of wrapping up this introductory screencast, I just want to quickly review some compelling pragmatic phenomena that we unfortunately won't get to discuss in detail in this course. I think you'll come away with tools that are helpful for explaining these things, but we won't get to do them justice here. First, quantifier domains. This has actually come up a number of times in our discussions of determiners. A naive view would be that a quantifier like everyone or no one will quantify over all people. But this is rarely the case. Rather, context is used to refine the domain. If I say everyone did well on the quiz, I clearly mean everyone in this course. If I say everyone is back at the car, I probably mean everyone on the journey with us, and so forth. In this everything bagel panel, people are playing around with this, right? Twitter user Patrick Mark Ryan says, come on, everything bagels, who are you trying to fool? You've got like six seasonings on there. That's a lot, but it ain't everything. And D. Weinman chimed in, last time I had an everything bagel, I got poppy seeds, Mira Sorvino, and Hegel's phenomenology of spirit all over my shirt. Talk about going wide with the domain for everything. Uh, this Yogi Berra line is a classic that we could describe as in the no deletion, right? No one goes there anymore. It's too crowded, meaning no one cool or no one in the no. Modality, in particular modal auxiliaries like must, can, and may, this can be so frustrating. In my elementary school, students were often admonished for saying, can I go to the bathroom rather than may I go to the bathroom? I consider this an injustice. Can in English has both ability and deontic, that is permission-oriented readings. And the teachers knew which one we meant. And this is just the beginning. Even within the space of ability readings of can, we have very different standards for Chris can make a three-point basketball shot and this elevator can hold 1,000 pounds. Focus. I really regret not having time to discuss focus since it manifests lots of fascinating interactions between semantics and pragmatics. Consider this minimal pair. Catherine called Chris a linguist, and then she insulted him with focus on insulted. And then we have Catherine called Chris a linguist, and then he insulted her with focus on the pronouns, and insulted actually deaccented. The second one is insulting to linguists because in deaccenting insulted, one indicates that it's old information in some sense, and the only way that could be is if we have in our common ground that calling someone a linguist is an insult to them. Ouch. The classic movie, The Conversation, actually turns on a very similar contrast. I don't want to give too much away, but I'll say that literally the entire movie turns on whether a surveillance expert has recorded the saying, he'd kill us if he got the chance, or he'd kill us if he got the chance. The surveillance expert who made the recording, a Harry Call, played by Gene Hackman, is tormented by this and the consequences it has for the things that he himself has done. Highly recommend this movie. Kill us if he got the chance. Kill us if he got the chance. Indexicals, these are expressions like I, you, and here, which have their hooks directly into the context of utterance. To a first approximation, their meanings might seem clear. For example, I is the speaker. But what about here? Uh, it might mean here is in the classroom, here is in at Stanford, or here as in on planet Earth. 
though the final one will violate some Gricean maxims until travel off the planet becomes common. So the standard for what counts as here is highly variable. And what about cases like reference transfer as when someone points at a map and says, we want to go here. And this is just the beginning of the pragmatic complexity. What you and we mean can be incredibly complex and variable. Sometimes we doesn't even really include the speaker as when it's used to describe a sports team that the speaker favors. Belief reports, is it false or just misleading to say that Lois Lane believes Superman is a reporter? My inclination is to say that it's merely misleading, but Lois would not agree. And finally, non-literal language use, metaphor, hyperbole, and irony and its mean-spirited special case of sarcasm. These are fascinating topics. Grice actually does touch on these, and we might be able to make some even stronger connections to them ourselves, but we again won't do them justice, and so they might be worthy of final projects. Okay, to round out this first screencast, let's return to Levinson's analogy. Consider the sentence, many students met with me yesterday. It seems like a straightforward and not too complex sentence, but now reflect on how much pragmatic reasoning one needs to employ to understand it. What's the time of utterance? Who's the speaker? What does student range over? How big is the domain? Why didn't the speaker say most students? What are the intended meanings conveyed for times other than yesterday? And so on, right? This is just a small sample of the pragmatic dependencies and pragmatic meanings that this sentence could involve. It's really amazing that we can communicate at all with language. Uh, in the next screencast, we'll try to use Gricean ideas to explain how it all actually happens.